Welcome to the Harry Future Stove House here at the Northern Hills Branch Library and online. And I'd just like to start with um, on behalf of the friends of Harriet Beecher Stonehouse, we respectfully acknowledge that the ground on which we stand are traditional Miami and Shawnee lands. We ex extend our esteem and gratitude to the indigenous people who call this place home. Welcome. It is the uh, main edition of our Voices for Truth discussion series. And our Voices for Truth discussion series sponsor is the School Outfitters who does great school furniture and office furniture and stuff like that. So go to their website, schooloutfitters.com, if you want to learn more about it. We also have some upcoming events I just want to briefly mention, and that is we have a couple of walking tours scheduled for uh, May. We have the Abolitionists and African Americans in Walnut Hills walking tour scheduled for Saturday, May 11th. And then we have our African American History Along the River Walking tour is scheduled for May 18th. Both of those start at 10 in the morning. So if you want information or tickets for those, you can go to our website. We have in June, Harriet's birthday party, which will be an outdoor extravaganza. It would be on Sunday, June 9th. And that is our free community event for the year. And then we have lots of housewarming activities planned for July 19th through the 21st as we invite people back into the restored spaces of the house. So even though we are currently on a pause for interior tours, because the contractors have the full run of this, we are um, anticipating and anxiously getting ready for that reopening events in July. All right, so this is how our discussion series will work. Uh, we, a lot, we do want to uh, acknowledge, thank uh, our discussion leaders, Dr. John Getz and Dr. Kathy Hart, uh, both from Xavier University. Um, we are going to let them get us started. John does a timeline to show us kind of the background and give us some context. And then we'll have some discussion questions about the readings. Don't worry if you didn't read all of everything, although I did last night, mm -hmm. but don't worry if you didn't read all of everything. You'll still have the opportunity to discuss and think and talk. And um, you know, if you're here, just jump right in. When you have something you want to say, if you're online, you can do the same. Or if you find yourself not getting like into, into it well enough, just raise your hand um, or your little virtual hand and we'll call on you. We go to about 8.15. So let's get started. I'm Chris. Uh, yeah, let's get started with the timelines. Uh, and these timelines are because we have four authors to deal with. Uh, I only took I took the uh, timelines only up to about the point where they wrote the selections we're reading. Uh, I don't want to give the impression that they quit doing things at that point. They did all kinds of things, but in fact, uh, two of them, Gloria Steinem and Wendell Berry, are still alive and doing things. But uh, for the sake of not spending the entire time on the timeline, I wanted to uh, wanted to do it that way. So Harriet Beecher Stowe, or Harriet Beecher, was born in Litchfield, Connecticut, in 1811. She's a New Englander. And she moves with her father, the Reverend Lyman Beecher, and his family near Cincinnati to Walnut Hills. And uh, he is the living in her will live, or in 1832, in the uh, what what is today the Harriet Beecher Stowe House, you know, along with his family. Um, so, and what we always say, quoting Joan Hedrick, the biographer of uh, Harriet, is that. She came to Cincinnati as a New Englander and she left as an American because she became exposed to the issue of slavery here from a variety of perspectives that she would not have seen had she been back in Connecticut for the rest of her life. Um, what I want to focus on with Harriet's biography today is uh, it starts in 1836. Uh, now note that she's already started publishing things the year, two years before that. She marries Calvin Stowe, a professor at Lane, 
And on September 29th, their twin girls, Harriet and Eliza, are born. Uh, and in Harriet Beach, what is today Harriet Beecher Stowe House. Uh, so what I want to do is play count the kids with Harriet. Count the kids. I count the love. It's okay. They got married in January. I know. I born in Say it. Yeah. Yeah. So they were just a teeny bit premature. Anyway, back to you, John. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Twin girls are born in 1836, the first year they're married. Two years later, son Henry is born. Remember, Harriet's at the time developing her, her statue, her career as a writer. 1840, Frederick is born. 1843, her daughter Georgiana is born, and Harriet is again ill. These two pregnancies, Frederick and Georgiana, were very physically punishing for her. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. So we got so we're up to five kids here in the first seven years of her marriage. That takes she's a full time writer. Plus, she's a full time writer. Why not? Oh, by eighteen forty six, you can see that she needed the water cure at Brattleboro, Vermont. Um, and I don't know if you want to. Talk about that sort of thing in the 19th century, or it was a uh, yeah. They took the waters. Mm -hmm. They did a lot of soaking in water and springs and things like that, dietary stuff. And uh, but most of all, according to Joan Edrick, the big success was getting away from her husband for a while and all those kids. Yeah. So we're talking about mental health this week. I think this was as important for her. Yes. yes. As well as her physical health. Yes. Yeah. And it was also an opportunity for many women who were there to network with one another in a way that they couldn't uh, otherwise. So, and her husband keeps writing to her saying, Is he coming all? Well, she keeps saying, I need a little more time here. <laughs> so, uh, so, but she does eventually come home uh, while sending him there <laughs> after that. This was their form of birth control and probably their most effective form being in other cities. Curious thing. Uh, so once they both get back to Cincinnati, another child is born. Samuel Charles, Charlie in 1848, unfortunately, and it was a heartbreak for Harriet, he dies at 18 months uh, in a cholera epidemic, which was happening all the time in Cincinnati at that point. Um, in 1850, so that we're up to number six, not counting whatever miscarriages might have been in there too, we don't know about. By 1850, she's pregnant with her last child, Charles Edward, and while pregnant, moves to Brunswick, Maine, uh, where her husband has taken a job at Bowdoin College. Uh, and Charles is born later that year, completing the family of six children. Uh, 1850, that happens. By 1851, she's writing Uncle Tom's Cabin. So I, I checked the ages of the kids at that point. The twins are 15. Henry is 13. Frederick is 11. Georgiana is 8. And Charles is one year old. While she's writing Uncle Tom's Cabin. Not bad. <laughs> now, if she did have servants, but that just made her write more to get the money. Calvin wasn't making much money, uh, and so Lane wasn't paying him very well, and even at Bowdoin, he wasn't uh, wasn't making a lot of money. So, um, so that gives you kind of an insight into Harriet, the Harriet housewife, writer, mother, uh, all sorts of roles at the same time. And think, since we're thinking about Steinem, it reminds me of the first issue of Ms., where she does that Indian woman figure. An Asian Indian woman figure with all sorts of arms mm -hmm. indicating all of the various tasks that she does. Uh, okay, so, and then the year after Uncle Tom's 
scavenge. She produces another book, A Key to Uncle Tom's Cabin, which meets the objections of Southerners who complained that she was too tough on slavery. She provides all sorts of documentation to show that, if anything, she was too easy on it in Uncle Tom's Cabin. Okay, fast forward. Marguerite Johnson, who will be nicknamed Maya by her older brother, is born in 1928. Uh, Goes to, uh, when the parents divorce in 31, she goes to Stamps, Arkansas, where she spends a good deal of her youth. Just six years later, Gloria Steinem is born in Toledo uh, to, uh, to Ruth and Leo Steinem, a traveling salesman. Uh, he was the founding editor of the University of Toledo student newspaper. Uh, very interested in campus activities, not very interested in going to school, apparently, and he never finished. Uh, dropped out fairly quickly while uh, his uh, future wife uh, actually did finish at the University of Toledo, Gloria's mother. Um, and Wendell Berry is born the same year as Gloria Steinem. So we've got you know, a contemporary, well, same generation group here in Maya Angelou, Gloria Steinem, and Wendell Berry. Berry, of course, born in, uh, in uh, Kentucky. And that's where he winds up. He traveled a good deal as a young man, but he, he and his wife wind up on the farm in Kentucky where they have, have been ever since. A terrible event for Maya in, 18, in 1936. She's abused and raped by her mother's boyfriend, tells her brother, she was trying to keep it secret, but she told her brother who tells the family and the man is murdered, uh, probably by Maya's uncles. Believing that her voice killed him, she will not speak for five years. So we're talking about voice here. Uh, this is a good example. She does eventually get, restore her voice thanks to a, the kind outreach of a of a neighbor who started who kind of took her under her wing, talked to her about literature, and got her to speak up. Steinem's pair, uh, Gloria. In starting in 1944, lives alone with her mother in Toledo. And that's those are the events that you read about in Ruth's song, where she's essentially her mother's caretaker during that time. Um, uh, you'll see that Maya develops quite a career as a performer, a singer, dancer, uh, actor. Uh, at the same time, Steinem is graduating magna cum laude from Smith College and actually gets a fellowship to go to India for a couple of years. And there's an Indian influence that she, and Gandhian influence that she cites, uh, particularly in her political activism sometimes. Mary, meanwhile, uh, you can see the difference in privilege here. I mean, Steinem did not come from money, but as she says her mother sold the house so that she could go to college, but she winds up at Smith Barry gets a master's degree from uh, UK and uh, opportunities to go to a writing, a creative writing program. Meanwhile, Maya was lucky to get out of high school, given her economic uh, bracket. Um, she's a journalist in Africa in the early 1960s, at the same time that Steinem is developing a career uh, as a freelance writer. And in 62, she publishes The Moral Disarmament of Betty Coet, um, which you can read about there. Uh, she also, in a famous article, goes undercover as a bunny at the Playboy Club in New York and writes a bunny's tale based on that, exposing the exploitive working conditions of the bunnies there. The name that she used, interestingly, uh, they, uh, this uh, undercover name she used was Marie Catherine Hope, who was her maternal grandmother. So it was kind of a tribute to her. Uh, okay, they begin uh, their, so Barry begins his uh, writing career, his first full-length book is published in 64. Uh, what's very relevant to the poem we're going to read, uh, talk about tonight, the piece of Wild Things is written in the same year, 1968, that he delivers his statement against the war in Vietnam. So he's a political activist. He needs the piece of wild things. Um, and so that's what the, uh, he delivers that at a Kentucky conference. And throughout his life, he has been an activist for environmental issues, anti-war issues, uh, defending a small farmer. 
Angelou makes it big in 1968 with her autobiography, the first book of her autobiography, I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings. Um, she's all by this time publishing poetry. Um, Steinem in 19, uh, public, publishing poetry. Steinem, on the other hand, is doing television journalistic writing and co-founds Ms. Magazine in 1972, uh, which is a huge seller at that time. Uh, and she was one of the editors for 15 years, still serves, I believe, on the board of the uh, of Ms., even though it's been sold and it's in a different publishing situation. Um, so, oh, 1978 is worth noting about Steinem. In Cosmopolitan, she publishes a satirical essay, If Men Could Menstruate. She's a satirical writer. She uses humor. And this is one of her core beliefs, I think, that she says it's the power of laughter. That's real power. It's our only free emotion, the one nobody can control. So her satirical writing, her humor, uh, is an important an important ingredient in her political activism and, and the things that she writes. Uh, and then, of course, Ruth's song appears in the collection in 1983. So that's kind of a quick run through on the, the careers of these people up to the point where we're talking about them. So let's go to the first question. Uh, which is in chapter 34 of Uncle Tom's Cabin, what do you see as the main threats to Cassie's mental health? And what do you see as her main strategies for preserving it? So let's hear what people have to say. <laughs> let's start with the first half of the question. What are the main threats to her mental health? Trauma after trauma after trauma. <laughs> yes, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, when I when I sat down to read last night, I was like, okay, so I'm just gonna skim the other top shelf because you know I already you have read right a few times. So, but then I started reading. I was like, oh, well, oh, this is the you know I mean it's 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 a really deep chapter, and it's also what I often use. You know, when I'm giving a tour or I'm talking to some of the visitors at the house, and I'm like, you know, when Harriet wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin, one of the things that she really emphasized was not just, you know, enslaved people weren't just beaten, they weren't just, you know, working without getting paid, but it was the family separations and the traumatic situations that families went through. And that part wasn't as well known amongst white people in the And so the white northern woman audience, they were really learning about this, you know, kind of almost for the first time. Yeah. Not completely, but it was like really emphasizing that she did not sugarcoat it. She really talked about it in the book. So, mm -hmm. so a woman is property. Um, violence against her, rape, basically, children being sold away from her. It's just like one day she goes out to do something and then comes back and they're gone. Yeah. It's like you didn't even have time to prepare for that. I don't know if that helped or not. Probably not, but it just is very traumatic. But the arbitrariness of living under under slavery, under you know, where, where people have absolute power over somebody they can do whatever they want and that's what happens well and it also seems to me it, it is exacerbated by her seeing her son in which she's telling the story and she sees him at some later point and he is ripped away from her literally ripped away from her again so you know at first they just disappear she then sees him yeah. he's being mistreated and you know, she's uh, probably her worst fears right there before her. And then he is taken away again. So it's a double, triple, quadruple drama to happen. There were two things that, that also struck me. The one having to do with the trauma is that she starts out describing her identity 
as you know, they would be paying comfortable and they're in a good situation. But these these the, the her identity is just called in they're just called the question torn apart repeatedly mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. by these traumas that seem to occur to her. Um, mm -hmm. and, and the um if for the slave the solution was God. Mm -hmm. They could you know they could it was heaven, it was afterlife, it was God will save me if you know if I lead a good life. And she had come to the point of despair where forget God. God's not gonna do a thing to you know, right. we don't that's not he's not an answer. So all the answers that are being fed to her by the, the, the social community and that she lived through her, her life, those answers have failed her and she's going to, 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 to give up, give up. Forget it. Yeah, we're 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 done. We're done. She feels she can't live a good life because she's constantly being used as a sex object and she feels guilt over that. Plus she feels she's carrying around the guilt for killing her two year old baby, her two week old baby, uh, to prevent him from having to grow up uh enslaved. Mm -hmm. Like a Margaret Garner and right, it creates Margaret Garner yes. in several years. Uh, Marty had a comment. Go ahead, Marty. Well, I just wanted to to jump in there and say this. I, I felt the same way you did, Christina. You know, I I didn't remember how heart wrenching this this chapter was um, until I read it again last night, and you know, where she says, everything is pushing us into hell. Why don't we just go? You know, that, that says, I've given up. There's, there's nothing for me. It doesn't matter what I do or what anybody does. Um, you know, everybody's again, everything is against me. The world is against me. God is against me. Um, I don't have any way to, to get out of this. Um, What do you think Harriet thinks of her mental state? Does Harriet seem to think that she's, some of the imagery maybe suggests that she's driven insane by, mm -hmm. by this experience? Mm -hmm. Do you think Harriet thinks she's crazy? I guess to put it in simple language. Maybe in some ways. <clears throat> It feels like, you know, every so often she's like, she's acting kind of the typical hysterical woman mm -hmm. role. And so she's talking, talking, you know, she's trying to, to minister or she's trying, you know, trying to physically minister to Tom's wounds. But then, and then she breaks down cries. And then she's like, okay, I'm going to do this again. And then she breaks down. So it's like she's, maybe that's kind of a stereotypical way of looking at, um, a woman who's experiencing this kind of mental anguish. What struck me is the way that it's written. Uh, she goes on for pages and pages. I mean, she rants and raves and uh, and, and it's either it, is, is she being the hysterical woman or is it bad writing? <laughs> And we know, you know, we know that there has there have been criticisms of Harriet sometimes overwriting. Um, but I mean, can you? I mean, if one of us were to sit here and just read this all out, I, it'd be like, oh my God, she couldn't possibly have done this and have said all of this, and you know, it, it's as if you want some, you want some physical change in the situation you want you know some kind of shifting that doesn't occur mm -hmm. it's it's so intense and so densely her her falling coming together and falling apart whatever it is all right next is Shelly go ahead Shelly so I think Harriet is incredibly sympathetic. Um, I mean, in order, the fact that she's able to draw that character and give voice to that kind of pain um, 
must have made, you know, there's always this discussion in literature whether uh, a writer's writing gets even beyond the writer, like whether through in the act of writing, they can do something even bigger than themselves, even bigger than their intention. But one way or another, at the very least, she was a conduit, I think, for this. I, I, this is a pain that needed to be expressed. I mean, you can get up on your soapbox and, cri and criticize the sentimental writers all you want. But I mean, my gosh, this is a woman who lost babies, who who lost um, grown children, who lost, you know, who's, who, you know, the cholera episode was going on, who'd witnessed a, a slave auction um, where, you know, mother and child were torn apart. So I think the fact that she gave voice to, to that in the person of Cassie, and then I don't want to get ahead of whatever Amy is about to say, but also the fact that she then gives you know, there's retribution through this, you know, that what follows in this very, you know, humorous par gothic parody scene. You know, um, I think Kathy get, Cassie gets, um, you know, a, a little bit of a of justice served. So I, I absolutely think that um, Harriet Beecher Stowe did something remarkable by, by drawing out this amazing scene. Thank you, Shelley. Go ahead, Amy. Well, I, I didn't want, like, Shelly, I don't want you to not say something because I always learn so much when you say something. Um, but, like, I was just counting, and it's six pages. Um, Cassie's speech is six pages long. So the thing that struck me, as at least on my version, what was remarkable was she's not interrupted. Tom doesn't interrupt her not one time. So she gets her whole story, or at least as much as she's going to share out. Um, and at least... When I've worked with, um, and I think most of you probably know that part of my career, I worked with survivors of trauma. That seems pretty true to me. Like if you let people tell their story, they will. Um, and so I think part of it, like part of it depends on the pacing. So this doesn't read like frenetic to me. It reads like she's unfolding the story piece by piece, not like she's rushing through it. So I think that's a, a brilliant piece of writing to be able to accomplish that. Um, the other thing I thought was interesting is that the chapter actually starts with Cassie offering Tom water. So in spite of what she's been through, she's resilient enough to show compassion to someone else that she sees that shared suffering. And that's kind of what I noticed in this chapter. Jeff, on what Amy just said, because the other part of this question is, what do you, what do you see as her main strategies for preserving some kind of mental health. I think this reaching out to Tom is really crucial. Rick, you do well, I was going to say the same thing is that she's she's developed a way to uh, nurse all these folks that are yes. being punished and, and she comes in and, and does the path for that you know, Despite maybe questioning God, she's being very Christ-like, you know, while she's doing this. And, you know, well, it gives her a purpose. It looks, yeah. I, 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 and it's around. Right, I can't do a lot, but I can help someone who's in pain. Yes, yes. And in the telling of her story, which I agree, in um, trauma treatment, it often builds to a point where people tell their story. Mm -hmm. And they do often, once they begin, need the time and the space to tell the whole story uninterrupted. Um, and I don't think that Cassie knew this, <laughs> but once she starts telling her story, she's got to tell the whole thing. And it has a healing effect for her. It doesn't heal all of her trauma. I'm, I'm not, you know, claiming she's cured or something after she's told the story, but at least momentarily, I wonder if that brings her some relief and, you know, some unloading of um, at least some of the many things that she has been to, through up to that point. Mm -hmm. 
you know, one of the ways to think about Tom in the book, throughout the book, is that he is kind of minister. He's uh -huh. not a name, but he uh -huh. certainly plays that he's always trying to convert people uh -huh. and spread, spread the gospel. And I think he's serving here as a kind of confessor, uh -huh. uh -huh. an ordained minister. Uh -huh. uh, and he is giving her just a seed of hope by, uh -huh. by hanging on, even though she uh -huh. keeps saying, don't, it's not worth it, you can't do it. But but he uh, but I think he uh, he has a, that effect on her. And Dan wanted to say something. Oh yeah, Dan. He's finding me on mute. Right? Muted. Okay. Yeah. Well, John just said it. Uh, he serves as a, a listener and a therapist to her. Uh -huh. uh, he's not offering her any solutions, but she needed uh -huh. somebody that would listen. And quite honestly, we know what was happening on uh, the, the plantation there. Uh, there wasn't very many people that could listen to her. So mm -hmm. she found uh, she found a therapist, somebody that would listen. And that therapist mm -hmm. was undergoing trauma themselves, but nonetheless. Mm -hmm. So I think John just said that much better than I can, but uh, he just got finished saying that, in fact. Thank you. Thinking as I was reading this about Victor Frankel, Amy has referred to him on other on other occasions. Man's search for meaning, and I, and I always ask myself, how does anybody survive in these conditions? You know, we find it tough enough to live day by day in the world we live in, and here are these people in these incredibly horrible conditions, and yet they go on. They, some, some, yes, some. absolutely, yeah. yeah. Uh, some find the, the resources to continue. And I think in Cassie's case, it may just be this ability to, to care for other people, to uh, address the wounds. She's all, almost a kind of Mary Magdalene to, uh -huh. to his Christ figure. Uh -huh. and, uh, and But that's what Frankel says. you got to find something outside yourself, right, yeah. to, uh, to yeah. identify with or to uh, give, give you a sense of purpose in a she she hasn't read Victor Frankel, but uh, she's kind of doing that. Mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's a survival strategy that, that she doesn't know why she's doing it. She just wants to do it. And she also cares for Emmeline, that 15-year-old uh, girl who Lagree has targeted as his next mistress. Mm -hmm. And she's worried about her. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So despite the fact that she says or communicates that she has no hope, which is a big part of what religion is for people, as has been stated, um, she does find purpose. She's going to take care of Emmeline. She's you know going to minister to or care for nurse other people who are who are being mistreated. Um, again, I'm, I'm certain she's not. I shouldn't say certain, but. It doesn't appear that she's put all this together for herself and said, oh, here's a way I can move forward. But she does have some purpose that all of us need and certainly seems to be one of the things that differentiate those people who can are more resilient following trauma versus those who are less resilient following trauma. Okay, any other comments on, uh, on this topic? I think we're ready to move on to the, uh, to the poem Still I Rise by Maya Angelou. And Joanne has offered to read that poem for us until everybody is refreshed. Uh, uh, Still I Rise, you may write me down in history with your bitter, twisted lies. You may trod me in the very dirt, but still like dust. Oh, lies. Does my sassy just upset you? Why are you beset with gloom? As I walk, like I've got oil wells pumping in my living room. Just like moons and like suns with the certainty of tides, just like hopes springing hot. Still, right. Did you want to see me broke? Bowed head and lowered eyes, shoulders falling down like teardrops, weakened by my soulful cries. Does my haughtiness offend you? I take it awful hard because I laugh like I've got gold mines digging in my own backyard. 
You may shoot me with your words. You may cut me with your eyes. You may kill me with your hatefulness. But still, like air, I rise. Does my sexiness upset you? Was the colors of surprise that I dance like I've got diamonds at the meeting of my fathers? Out of the huts of history's shame, I rise. Up from a past that's rooted in pain, I rise. I'm a black ocean leaping and wide, welling and swelling I bear in the tide. Leaving behind nights of terror and fear, I rise into a daybreak that's wondrously clear. I rise, bringing the gifts that my ancestors gave. I am the dream and the hope of the slave. I rise, I rise, I rise. Thank you. Yeah, you could really hear her ring around. Yeah, probably. Yeah, this poem makes you read out loud. And really, you really have to do that. So the question about it is, uh, what do you think allows Angelou and those for whom she speaks to continue to rise? What is the survival strategy here? Confidence. That's what I read. So simple. Where does the confidence come from? <laughs> Go ahead, Shelly. Um, I've read that poem differently every time I re read it, but I think here lately I have settled on the confidence comes from the long history of um of African American people, and particularly African American women. There is so much embedded, you know, like the diamonds and everything that's a reference to the blood diamonds. And I mean, there's so much that is um, historically referential, as well as the, you know, hypersexualization of black women that sort of is, um, you know, reclaimed by um, in this poem uh, by the speaker's voice. So I, I think there's, I think it's the fact that the I is so representative it's both you know the poet is able to center the eye as a singular voice but also able to speak for people historically across history so short version the strength of the strength of history and the claiming of of, of history of, of the version of history that the speaker is putting out there i guess So it's a it's an individual eye, but a communal eye at the same time. She's speaking for for a community, and there's where the strength comes from. I think. Mm -hmm. Any other sources of the of the pride or the confidence here? Well, knowing her her history. Um, she has had been through this terrible, you know, incident, ongoing incident with, you know, being sexually abused and, and then the guilt of that she carried because her abuser was, was murdered and she wasn't sure whether that was right or not. I mean, that's my, that's my interpretation of her, her um, not speaking for, what was it, five years or something like that. And yet she found the strength, she personally found the strength to get past that. And like Shelley says, she, she's a, a symbol for the community, you know, that she herself was able to get past that and then she can see around her others who have have been able to do the same thing. And she's writing this to encourage others who may be going through things right now and saying, I continue to rise, you can too. Mm -hmm. 
The other part of that is that before she was a writer, she was a performer and she was a dancer and a singer. And, and, and I mean, mm -hmm. and no small, no small dance troupe. Why? Well, I think it was Alvin Ailey. Yeah. So she, she had quite, had, had already built quite a name for herself, a profile that would be very public. And I can imagine when you, what I look at is the refrain, does my sassiness upset you? Or does my haughtiness offend you? Um, does my sexiness, and upset you. Some of those are traits that would be coming out in the process of being a performer or being a dancer by the very nature of that art. And maybe she is is very self aware of that and knows, you know, what the feedback that she gets, as well as the fact that she's had to develop those traits in order to do a good job as a performer. And she uses those as a jumping off point sometimes, I think, to make more important, stronger points. Amy, go ahead. Got it. I got it. Okay. I had to hit the mute button. Um, I think along those same lines is performing her refrain, I rise. It's if I'm if I'm scanning it right, and heaven knows there are way better qualified people on this call than me to know that. But it, they're both stressed syllables. It doesn't seem like one is an unstressed syllable. So that is like a drumbeat, like I rise, and it just keeps pounding through the poem. Um, I thought that was interesting um, for rhythmically. The other piece, like because that refrain repeats three times at the end, like rhetorically, I wonder and and. You did an amazing job of reading it. Like each time, depending on who's reading it, the revelation they have in those sentences would kind of cause you to read those two words three different times, three different ways, um, which is an interesting thing. And then the other thing, I never noticed this before with as many times as I've read the poem. In the first stanza, she rises like dust, but later down, she rises like air. And I just thought that was an interesting change in what rises. And I didn't know what it meant because I've never noticed that before. But I thought that was interesting. She rises like the tides, too. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Oh, wait. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, no, that's I don't know. Yeah. All the elements. All the elements of fire. <laughs> It's a great observation about this. We'd call that a spondy. That's the poetic foot in which you have two stressed syllables. I rise. Now you could play around with it to the I rise, I guess, but but basically both of those words do get an accented. And that's a poetic segment of poetic meter known as a spondy. It's a slow, it slows you down to uh, to say that. I like the references to black history in here too, and to white history, which she says, you may write me down in history with your bitter twisted lies. In other words, you could write the sanitized white history, which is what we've had for so long, um, but I'm gonna rise. You're gonna, my day is coming and uh, you're gonna hear from me. So she's correcting me. That that absence in the, in the, the way that for years we understood American history. Something else I always notice about this poem is: Do you want to see me broke and bowed head and lowered eyes? Now this is beyond slavery. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's the the culture saying. You should be. You should still be submissive. You should still not. You know, don't flaunt yourself, your pride. And I think that's part of the reason that Obama got such a backlash, because he wasn't that way. He was very upfront and very comfortable in who he was, and uh, he didn't act submissive at all. Uh, and I think that was that's part of the backlash we've seen since he was uh, since he was president. One other line that I uh, that I like.
like the it's the line of uh, leaving behind nights, well, two lines, nights of terror and fear. I rise into a daybreak that's wondrously clear. That to me is an echo of something we talked about not too long ago in this group, uh, James Weldon Johnson's Lift Every Voice and Sing, Facing the Rising Sun of Our New Day Begun, that line. And so I think she's, again, drawing on the history, drawing on the, it's a communal statement. I think she's trying to evoke with every voice and sing. And uh, with, with a line like that, bringing the gifts that my ancestors gave. So she's tying it all into the, uh, to the ancestry and to the history. Shelly, you want to yeah, sorry. Shall we go to the next? Just one more thing on, on, on the tale of what um John just said there about um tying it into the poetic history. She's also clearly referring to um to uh oh my gosh, that we wear the mask. We, you know, we mm -hmm. wear the mask that grins and lies, which she later we we know she knows and is interested in because she later does a, um, a a version of a spoken word version of that poem called The Mask that actually, so I, I do love that, you know, Amy got us thinking about the sort of the real close reading of the poem and the sort of poetic rhetoric of it. And she is clearly, as you said, referring to lift every voice and, th and sing, but um, the fact that she would encode that much African-American poetry, like the poetic tradition as part of what makes her rise is, is remarkable. Okay, well, let's move on to the uh, third question. We need to talk about Ruth's song. Kathy, do you want to pose that question first? You know, I, it's clear, I think, in Ruth's song that there's some mental health issues going on. <laughs> I think it doesn't take a close reading to make that one. Um, what do you think are the main drivers, the main threats to her mental health? Are they internal, external? What, how do you understand this struggle that she has? Yeah, in Cassie's case, it was pretty clear the threats were external. They were yeah. coming from the outside. Yes. But is it the same situation here or not? I don't think it really explained how or why she had the mental breakdown. Uh -huh. It just, you know, everybody in her family just knew that oh, this is the way it was, and they had to work around it. Even, uh -huh. even as children, uh -huh. they had to, you know, take on the responsibility of caring for her because of this mental breakdown that uh -huh. at some point. And it wasn't really clear as to you know what the trigger for that was. Uh -huh. And so that's part of the question. But it, it does, yeah, I'm reflecting back on uh, the timeline. Harriet Beecher Stowe has something happen mm -hmm. and goes and takes the waters in Vermont, which does sound very appealing, by the way. Oh, sounds like uh, really nice. But something has happened to her. She goes and gets treatment. Something happens to Ruth. She ends up, I mean, because we're now in the 20th century, she ends up in an asylum, an institution, a mental hospital, whatever we, you know, we, they've gone by various names, um, where by that time the treatment is very different. In the 1800s, when pe there, there were asylums in the 1800s, horrible, really like places, <laughs> terrible. But if you were wealthy enough, you could go off and take the waters and rest, you know, do those sorts of things. But by the 20th century, our alleged understanding of mental health has moved to the point where you need treatment, quasi, or in her case, medical treatment. She's going to get a uh, a substance, I'm not going to call it medication, yeah. but because she ends up um, taking, at least after she's out, taking a, what did they call it? A coral, coral hydrate, but it um, was Dr. Brown's, Brown's yeah. you know, something, some, you know, tonic of some sort. Yeah, which, 
really was very dangerous to be taking. But, you know, so, so she's now falling under a different way of understanding people's experiences and their reactions to them or what's going on internally for her. But thinking about where she was in her life, what do you think was going on? What what caused her to have this nervous breakdown? Which is what it was common. No, I had to, actually John helped me with that. I wondered the same thing, was that her brother? It's actually her brother-in-law, uh, right? It was Gloria Stein. I've got the impression my, maybe a family kind of. Right, yeah. It's on her father's side. It's yes, yeah, so it's on, on the her father's side. side. Not her mother's side. Not her mother's side. Right. Yeah. So you went to the is there some genetic yeah, or yeah. something? Sure, one thing that was interesting to me was that she received I think um care but not treatment. Is that what mm -hmm. twenty years of like, something like that? Uh, the biggest reason my mother was cared for but not helped. Right. And that's, you know, really diplomatic. I get her. Right. And before she went away, I think. What I'm trying to say is, I, maybe I've got timeline wrong. But, okay. Yeah. I have a knife. Sorry. <laughs> timeline. And it was not clear. How much older the older sister was, but it seemed like it was a pretty nine years old. Yeah, oh, okay. just nine. Or it's very plausible that she had multiple miscarriages in between the two months, and multiple miscarriages might have uh -huh. triggered some, some something. Just thinking, right. I mean, we don't. Yeah, but know. she had. And the bottom line is, we don't know. But she had this event that, you know, meant in many events like this for women were referred to as nervous breakdowns. Mm -hmm. You know, what does that really mean? Um, it's not a medical diagnostic term, really. Um, but I, I, as I look at her circumstances. I am reflect on the fact that she showed so much promise, had ambition, she finishes college, she, you know, is a reporter, she's, you know, doing other things, and then she's paired with um, a kind, but I can't remember how Gloria describes him, but he's just kind of disorganized person who, it, you know, perhaps because of the, the time she felt she needed to follow. And so she ends up, in fact, following him from place to place and serving in a very traditional wife role. So whereas it appears she aspired to something else and certainly had that capability, she finds herself trapped um, with the, the first daughter and then eventually Gloria, but Gloria comes after her hospitalization yeah. or after hospitalization, that's too kind a word, <laughs> after her time in the asylum. Marty wanted to say something oh. too. Go ahead, Marty. Um, I think I lost my train of thought. Um, yeah, I was going to say, you know, I think I, I, I got the feeling that she had some underlying issues early on in her life and she kind of overcame them and went to college and then started this career. And then she, you know, got married. And as you were saying, you know, her husband was, was um, aimless I, is, a, I think, uh -huh. a polite way to say yeah. it, you know, he, he wandered a lot. And uh -huh. she, she wandered after him you know she went with him because she because like you said she felt like it was the thing to do you know uh -huh. this was this was before the time when it was acceptable to uh -huh. divorce right you know so it she before Gloria, it was before Gloria Steinem that's, that's right she, yeah that's yeah. right yeah. <laughs> That's a good way of putting it. You're right. Um, so, so she just, 
she just had to go along and uh -huh. and then she the the piece that got me was when they were in Michigan and he was having to travel oh, yeah. and and she couldn't stand being by herself um uh -huh. with with Gloria because uh -huh. she was it didn't say this but i got the feeling that she was afraid of what she was going to do and so you know, she started going with him, but she would just sit in the car and Gloria and her father would go off and do things and she'd sit in the car and wait for them. Uh -huh. I mean, I, I just found that so, so heartbreaking I, I, that um, she just, she just couldn't, couldn't get her, get back to what she was when she was in college and had that early career. Um, uh -huh. Um, I, I don't know, you know, um, you know, and obviously the, the quote medication that, you know, the drug that she was on, that she got addicted to as part of her, she was given it as a treatment and then she became uh -huh. addicted to it certainly uh -huh. didn't help. Um, uh -huh. and that kind of goes back to, you know, Harriet also, you know, part of the reason why she had some of her issues was she also, um, took tonics, which uh -huh. at the time, you know, included mercury. So that's, uh -huh. she, she, she most likely had mercury poisoning. Okay. So. Dan, go ahead. You have to unmute. Unmute. <laughs> He's there, we there we go. Just for the record, chloral hydrate is a very strong uh, sedative. It's um it's also known as a Benny because uh it was used by earlier mafia people to kill. It's very it doesn't taste, you don't have a lot of taste to it. So it was put in coffee and killed people. So um it's you have to remember that at the time that this is being written, there's not very many pharmaceutical agents to treat any type of uh, even sedatives, there's got a lot of them. So uh to say that she was mistreated with uh, chlorohydrate. Uh, that was just about the only thing that they could treat her with at that time. At that time, so right, um, right, 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 right. I mean, there were virtually no treatments. Well, actually, I think it's safe to say there were no effective treatments for anything that we would today call a mental illness prior to right. the 1950s. Um, so yeah, it's it it's only in retrospect that we can you know, recognize the dangers. Um, I also, Dan, I did a little uh, research on the uh, Dr. Brown's tonic or whatever the heck it was called. Um, and it can cause, it, certainly it's highly addictive. He was taking it in small doses, I'm assuming, because it didn't kill her. Um, and it can cause hallucinations. And there's a, oh, yeah. a point where the, yeah. you know, where Gloria makes reference to her mother, you know, sort of being in this inebriated state and seeing things or having visions. It's through a, a yeah. window. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Right. I mean, so she's got these. They really sound like hallucinations as opposed to delusions um, that were medication or were this, you know, substance induced mm -hmm. as opposed to the core psychiatric disorder that was likely going on. Although it's, it's very hard to know. We have a couple of hands up. Let's hear from Virginia first and then we'll go back to Shelly. Thank you. Hi. Um, so I'm just trying to collect my thoughts. So I guess like the high level thing that I'm thinking about is it's not necessarily an internal thing versus an external thing. It's more of her reaction to having to be forced into like a patriarchal system, right? So she never was able to really fulfill her own song, right? So she's always um, kind of, that's her reaction to being invalidated for, to use kind of a mental health term, right? So she just keeps getting clipped and then she keeps getting reacting to that. And then she's forced into hospitalization, which of course is a patriarchal, you know, to overuse that theme, but, you know, she's being forced into this caged existence and she keeps trying to find her own 
self within that. So I, I don't know. I mean, I think we've, you all have kind of said that, but just sort of high level bare bonesing of it. That's kind of what I was thinking perhaps. Yeah, thank you. Imagine as a woman, I'm asking you guys to do this too. <laughs> as a woman, you you are brilliant. You go through school, you go you graduate from school, you end up with a very good job as a reporter. And I, what else was she something else? Mm -hmm. um, and after a year or two of that, all the doors are closed on you. And it's like, oh, well, that was fun, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Now convert yourself into a new existence. Mm -hmm. um, and she's converting herself into like a domestic sphere, but mm -hmm. beyond that, she's posting mm -hmm. people at a lodge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and she's. Mm -hmm. It's because she made a taste. Mm -hmm. so here, 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 here. Oh. And we're not even successive, but it's self expression and of, mm -hmm. of starting to delve into what are my talents and what can I contribute professionally mm -hmm. and look what I can do for my children mm -hmm. and then. All right. And I'm telling you that because it's still happening. Mm -hmm. It happened to a lot of people in my age group. It happened to people in my family. It happened to my cousins. And it's why some of them are the way they are today. Mm -hmm. Shelly was, and that, and that, you know, Shelly, you yeah. learned something from all that. Mm -hmm. You know, the story that she tells is heartbreaking and it's, and, and it's, it's so intense and so detailed. But Gloria rose above that and said, no, we can't, women can't. This. That's what she's, that's what she learned from this, I think. And, and she took, she became the leader that she is for women because of it. Shelly, did you want to interject something? Sorry. Just yeah. really echoing what Virginia and um, Joanne have already said so well, I think that it's really, you know, there's really a fine line between, um, quote, mental illness and existential angst. I mean, I guess that yeah. this sort of, this sense of, um, okay, that was a big tease. And now mm -hmm. I have this gaping, this, you know, where do I go with this desire and thought that I would be empowered and yet I I I can't be and I'm just I mean sort of this level of of distress and I, I think our leader um would be able to tell since um she's a, a psychology professor would be able to say much better than that than I could the fact that you know you can get um, quote mental illness can come from um multiple sources, whether it's genetic or whether it's trauma-based or whether it's um, based in this sort of purposeless, this Frank, Victor Franklian sense of meaninglessness or despair or whatever. Just comment and then we'll move on. Go ahead. Well, Shelly just kind of said it better than I could, but I think there were two different passages in the in the story, one where um, Gloria talks about like how other women other than her mother have had the resilience to survive her experience. But then I think it's later and I couldn't find the second line. I had highlighted it, but I can't find it um, where she says, you know, lots of women have had her mother's experience. So there's a universality in what she saw as her mother's suffering, but also an, at the same time, an acknowledgement that not everyone has the same um, hardship in dealing with it, if that makes sense. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, let's move. Uh, well, uh, well, let's have Joanne. We need the piece of wild things. Peace. So yeah. let's have Peace. Joanne read that. And then, oh. Yes. It's one of my most favorite of all poems. The piece of wild things. When despair for the world grows in me and I wake in the night at the least sound in fear of what my life and my children's lives may be, I go and lie down where the wood drake rests in his beauty on the water 
and the great heron feeds. I come into the peace of wild things who do not tax their lives with forethought of grief. I come into the presence of still water and I feel above me the day blind stars waiting with their light. For a time, I rest in the grace of the world and am free. So in this poem, um, Barry seems to be recommending a treatment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he is. What he is. Yeah. He is. Thoughts about that. This is this is his recommendation or this is his description of how he manages his despair. And I don't I have now just, I just realized I have equated despair with a mental illness or a mental health disorder, and they are not the same. We can all experience that, hopefully we're not experience a lot of despair, but those, those are real feelings that we have. We don't want to over pathologize or pathologize everything and call, you know, all negative things, but thoughts about this as a, as a, way of managing our mental health more broadly. Go ahead, Amy. Okay, so it's been a personal journey of mine to learn about wellness um, measures in the last few years. And one of the most pronounced ones is to spend time in nature. So this poem speaks to that for me. Um, through, you know, every line of this. And it also, I was just thinking, it, tying it to the poetic lineage, he's free in nature. And to me, of course, that makes me think of um, Caged Bird, which also ties back to my, uh, to my Angelou. So there's something about nature that is freeing. And I know that that's an oversimplification because that is neither what Maya Angelou is talking about when she talks about a caged bird, nor is it the original poem. However, there is that that natural line through all of them. Um, and Wendell Berry seems to be saying through his poem, I find I find solace in nature that helps heal some of these wounds. At least that's how I read it. So I never thought about this before until when you talk about, you know, this is a healing kind of thing. So I roughly you know this. But I was going to Hanover, which is near Madison, Indiana. And um, so for since college, since I was 18 years old, except for two years that I lived in Columbus, I have lived less than five miles, well, seven. I've lived less than seven miles from the Ohio since I was 18. And when I think about it, whenever I'm like, just like, one of the things that I do to like de-stress and I just need to get out and just experience nature. My experience of nature is I go to a bench that is a bluff of the Ohio River and I sit and watch the room. Mm -hmm. mm. I've never really done that since I was 18. <laughs> 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 Wendella and Della Berry. There you go. That's interesting, Christina. You know, I grew up here in Cincinnati and left for 30 plus years and came back, of course, now. But all the places that I lived other than here, I always felt like I didn't, I never knew which way was North, East, South and West. Whereas here in Cincinnati, kind of weird, but I always know where the river is. I always know which direction I'm, which direction is which. And when I would go to a new place and I've moved a lot, I would always have to find another 
um, landmark to anchor myself on. Um, and I'd say, well, I'm used to having a river there. What am I, how am I supposed to know where I am? And people would, you know, look at me funny. And, but when you think about it, I, I did, I always had that anchor. I knew where I was when I was here. So interesting to think about that. We, we are at our core biological animals. <laughs> we are animals who have spent, you know, in our millennia of existence, not personally, but in the existence of our species, you know, 99% of that time has been in nature, not in cities. And there is increasing recognition um, in the mental health world that it is um, beneficial for people's mental health, whether you have a diagnosed condition or not, to have ways of connecting with nature. Mm -hmm. Because that's really, you know, just sort of biologically part of us part of what we are, that's really what we, uh, most of our evolutionary experience has been in close contact with nature. We have to seek that out now, many of us who are living in cities. So we look to the river, and I realized as you were talking about that, I do that too. I don't actually go sit by the river, I take a walk by the river, but I am drawn to look at the river and there's something about watching the river that I find really peaceful. And, and you know, for me, for you and I, it's the river, for others, it's, you know, other things. But, and, and I'm, I'm not saying that, um, well, I, I guess one other thing I'll say is, I'm gonna go back to um, uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe, who went to the waters. <laughs> And early asylums, not all of them, because um, there's famous in-city, you know, horrible asylums, but in the uh, early mental health era in the late 1800s, the asylums were put out in fields, in open areas. And you could argue that that was to get those people away from everybody else for, in good and bad ways. But it did take people out into more natural settings that for many people was very calming. That's not the only thing we need to do. Many <laughs> things that you know distress us, but that can be and is increasingly recognized by some as an important component to our self-care and our mental health and even as part of more formally as part of people's treatment. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Wendell Berry. Beautiful reading. <laughs> yeah, I, I would add to that that of course there are many kids who don't who grow up in the cities and don't have access to mm -hmm. well, they can't go to the Ohio River very easily. Or, right. Uh, and so there is a movement and uh, uh, to get kids from that situation and take them out into nature. Mm -hmm. Libby Hunter, who uh, was the founder of Play many years ago, is now. Uh, one of the founders of something called Adventure Crew, and that's what they do. They take urban kids who don't really have access to nature out and let them, mm -hmm. you know, let them camp out or do things. Yeah, you wanna say something else? <laughs> <laughs> Unmute. <laughs> one last thing. Um, I am fortunate that my backyard is only 40 feet from a lake in Florida. So big birds come every single morning to our lake and I, that's wonderful. And I'm also fortunate in the other direction that I'm only five miles from Atlantic beach. Um, both of these places I call, both of these places I call my sacred places. Uh, so um, just, just that's, that's just something I'd say that they're very calming. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. All right, you want to close this out? Any close this out. I've talked enough. I want to say one more thing. Hang on. Go ahead, Shelly. 
Uh, just one more thing I think that is interesting is historically those people who have been able to have the access to nature have had better mental health. I mean, I think of Harriet Beecher Stowe with the waters, but you know, Ruth Hall written in 1854 describes her friend going to the asylum and it was terrible. And so I think we, if we remember the fact that Harriet Beecher Stowe was from, I guess what we call kind of a progressive um situation okay. where she they they thought you know hey this could be something that could be good for mental health and I think then as now this kind of treating people like people and doing things like being able to give them nature and and other things and we we all have mental health whether we have pathological illnesses or not and I just love that this like kind of this final tie, I, I just love that you put Wendell Berry last and this sort of reminded us of that, that this very human and, and nature. Um, and it, it's just a beautiful way to close. So. Yeah. Just close with one line from Derek Berry's poem. He talks about day blind stars waiting with their light. Mm -hmm. Can't see the stars in the daytime unless it's a total eclipse. <laughs> Normally, we don't see the stars, but they're out there. They're still up there, leading with their light. So you, it's hopeful because you can't always see the good, but sometimes it's there. Well, thank you all very much for joining us today. Thank you to everyone participating here and everyone participating online. Uh, remember, we've got tons of things still going on, even though the house is closed on the interior for a couple of months. And we will I'll pick this series back up in September um, and we'll be coming to you from the Harry Beecher Step House in a line, but we'll, we'll figure out a space that, that works for us around us by that point. So thank you all for coming tonight and we appreciate it. Thanks, good, everybody. Have a good evening.